Every so often we get an email here at the GM Word of the Week Tower of Indescribable Difficulty that surprises us. We try to avoid it pretty assiduously, but sometimes we give out the address just to see if anyone is actually listening. Unfortunately, it often turns out that you are. Even more occasionally, we make the double mistake of asking for, or sounding as if we're asking for, your suggestions. At which point, a few of you dutifully provide some which we never quite get around to doing much with unless we save them up for an end-of-the-year, get-out-of-jail-free episode or two. Which is not to say we are ungrateful for it all. Far from it. We very much appreciate our listeners' efforts and contributions. Oftentimes, it is your suggestions that propel us down a path so interesting that we find ourselves compelled to cover that rather than the initial suggestion. It's just a quirk of how the research and writing for the show works. We chase what sounds interesting and interests us. But every so often we get a message that gives us pause. Not because it is particularly difficult to understand or because it presents a topic we've never heard of before, though both those things have, on occasion, happened. But rather because the message's author seems to have missed something fundamental in the way the show works. Case in point the email we received from someone we're going to call Donnie in order to protect their identity and keep them out of any more trouble than they are already in. Marie starts out nicely enough by explaining how much they love the show and the format and everything, and that's great. We love hearing that sort of thing. So far, so good. But then Mickey goes on to say that they just wanted to ask, what happened to the D&D aspect of it? And that's where we had to stop to make sure Peter had written in to the correct show. See, we know we've explained before how the show has evolved over the years in the very show which is doing the evolving. And we're certain we've said that part of the problem with producing a show, which is exclusively focused only on things directly found in D&D, is that you very quickly run out of show-length relevant bits to cover. And we're dead certain that we further explained that Dungeon and Game Masters are clever folks, and that when presented with an interesting thing to know, they are more than capable of extrapolating full-blown adventures off the merest tidbit of fact. Providing a full suite of context and relevance to go around that tidbit is just icing on the cake. All you have to do is get the interesting bit in there for amazing adventures to happen. But okay, let's assume we've drifted far, far afield from our intent to help GMs and DMs put more flavor in their flavor text. That is the whole tagline of the show, after all. Let's quickly look at the last 52 episodes, a year's worth of shows, and see how many were directly related to D&D or other RPGs, and how many weren't. That takes us all the way back to Mirror, a topic submitted by a listener, so that gets a D&D centric pass, especially since it mostly covered magic mirrors. Adaptation was all about making things from pop culture work at the table. Sword? Hello? Fur was about getting components from creatures. If peasants, kings, and outlaws aren't directly relevant, we can only assume your D&D world isn't out of the bone tossing age yet. Chimeras? Yes! Magic Potion seems an obvious qualifier, and Hollow Earth directly explained the Underdark and recommended further RPG experiences. So that's 10 that directly reference D&D. Of course, then there are all the other things you might run across in a pseudo-medieval world like the one D&D is based on. Locks for getting up and down rivers, drums, cow, cheese, butter, milk, water wheels, spectacles, transitioning from oars to steam on your boats and ships, a specialized calendar that reflects your world's solar system. White Horse discusses Pegasus, there's ancient firefighting techniques, two very scary monsters preventing people from going places that also includes an exciting story of adventure, one of the oldest ever, the development of ovens, pots, pans, and tableware to add realism to your medieval feasts, a whole month of trickster gods and stories, a month about discovery, travel, and trade, and a whole month we just finished about how empires rise and fall. And, and, look, the whole bloomin' show is about D&D. All you need to do is look at it right. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. Nope. It's okay. We're better now. 
we're not going to let little Davy get under our skin. True, we sometimes do episodes that aren't as directly related to Dungeons & Dragons as they used to be back in the early days, but we still believe we offer the budding GM or DM plenty of fodder and flavor for their games. However remote it may be, though, the possibility does exist that we could do better. Fortunately, Mike had some suggestions for us. According to Anne, they flipped open their DMG to three random pages and came up with the following. We might as well give them a good look to see if we can build an episode around them. Emily's three randomly selected words are Chalcedony, Citern, and Sahuagin. Right, well, it was a good try, Charlotte. Thanks for playing. Seriously, though, look at these suggestions. Sure, they're in the DMG, but they're mostly just words. Only one of them is D&D specific. The other two are just... Well, look at Chalcedony. Sure, it looks like a fancy word of obscure meaning that must definitely have some sort of fantastical background to it, but when you get right down to it and start poking, it just lays there. The word itself comes to us through Middle English and means, hold on to your hats for this one, a precious stone. Well, thanks, Middle English speaker, for that whole say-what-you-see definition. It's not entirely their fault, though. They had the help of Anglo-French, Latin, and Greek to come up with it. It's kind of a warning sign, really. Basically, the original use of the word chalcedony was to describe any precious stone you might happen upon, which covers such a broad range of potential stones that it's generally pretty hard to narrow things down enough to derive a usefully informative episode from it instead of just listing all the potential stones chalcedony could refer to. Like... We could just spend the next paragraph telling you that Chalcedony in modern usage covers stones such as agate, carnelian, chrysoprase, fire agate, heliotrope, moss agate, chrome chalcedony, and onyx. But that would be no better than the creators of D&D who just needed a list of semi-precious stones to bridge the gap between coinage and actual gemstones, and so opened up their college geology textbooks and poured all the words straight into the DMG without actually explaining why so many were needed or what was supposed to be accomplished by including them all. And we'd never do that to you, Graham. No, John. Instead, we'd have to take a look at all those various stones and see what might be interesting about them or how they might actually be useful or some little detail that makes them all stand out so that you'd know why they had to be included and couldn't all be lumped under a single entry called pretty but relatively inexpensive rocks to use as rewards for your players. For instance, Eric, we'd have to dig into agate pardon the slight pun, and explain that most agates exhibit a color banding effect due to the way minerals were deposited during the stone's formation as part of volcanic or metamorphic rocks. No doubt you'll recall that metamorphic means the rock you have was made from the transformation of other rocks that already existed rather than being formed from new material. Agate got its name, in case you were wondering, Terry, from Greek philosopher and multi-talented man about town Theophrastus who lived in the 3rd and 4th centuries BCE. Or should that be 4th and 3rd centuries? We're never quite sure what order to do that in. Anyway, Carol, Theophrastus was interested in all sorts of things, as any ancient Greek philosopher should be. He enjoyed a bit of biology and physics along with the philosophy. But what really set Theophrastus apart were two things. First, his name. See, Theophrastus wasn't his given name. Nope, that was Tertimus. But Tertimus was a student of Aristotle, and apparently such a good student that he would take over from Aristotle in the peripatetic school of philosophy. And you may be asking yourself, William, what qualified Tertimus to take over for Aristotle? Well, the answer is in the name we know him by today. Aristotle gave it to him, and it means godly phrased. In other words, Theophrastus had what Aristotle considered to be a divine style of expression. In other, other words, he talked himself into the job. Interestingly, peripatetic means given to walking about. The peripatetic school itself was just a name given to the students of Aristotle who would meet each day at the Lyceum to discuss philosophical and scientific matters. It does not, as later stories might relate, refer to the fact that Aristotle and company liked to walk about while lecturing, 
Rather, it comes from the fact that they often held their meeting under the Lyceum's covered walkways. The second thing that sets Theophrastus apart, or at least the second thing we're going to mention, because there really was quite a bit to distinguish him from many other Greeks of his time, Leonard, was his status as the father of botany. The thing of it was, Theophrastus was essentially the Pliny the Elder of the plant world. Not sure who Pliny was, DeForest? Check out our Pliny episode for a refresher. He comes up a lot. Theophrastus decided to catalog basically every plant he could, and he created two multi-volume books of all the information he had, one called Inquiry into Plants, which was ten volumes, though only eight survived to the modern era, and the other called On the Causes of Plants, which was originally eight volumes with six survivors. In Inquiry into Plants, Theophrastus classified plants into several groups based on where they could be found, how they were grown, and what practical uses they might have. Of course, he included trees as well, those occupied three entire volumes of their own. And it is speculated that the missing two volumes from that set deal with plants that produce edible seeds and those that produce gums and resins. On the causes of plants, was much more geared to the Greek farmer, discussing as it did the methods of propagating plants, increasing their yield, how they should be sown and reaped, and the tools used to raise them as well as any soil amendments needed to do so successfully. All this made up the first real study and classification of plants ever done. Hence, the father of botany. Now remember, B, we said Theophrastus was sort of the Pliny the Elder of plants. Well, this applies for two reasons. First, the plant books were used on a regular basis practically from their inception through to the Middle Ages in various parts of the world. They were the go-to reference for everything about plants, just like Pliny's encyclopedias were for everything else in the world. Second, while Theophrastus made plenty of his own observations throughout Greece and probably even in his own back garden, he, like Pliny, was often given to relying on some questionable information brought to him by far-traveling merchants and traders. Some of it was useful and valuable information to be sure, because without the travelers he wouldn't have been able to include many of the more interesting plants of Asia, such as frankincense, myrrh, and cinnamon. And of course, Estelle, Pliny borrowed heavily from the earlier works of Theophrastus when it came time to do his own encyclopedia. Pliny, now that you mention it, Rue, also had some things to say about Chalcedony, or rather, about the sorts of stones that came from Chalcedon, which is how Chalcedony gets its name. See, lots of precious stones used to come out of the copper mines at Chalcedon, but they were never very good when compared to those from other regions. The only advantage the stones had was that they were coming from the nexus of several major trade routes, and so the name for the stones of Chalcedon stuck anyway and got spread around. Once the copper mines ran out, so too did the precious stones. And then, really that's it. Sure, we could go on a bit about how the city of Chalcedon was a town in Asia Minor that sat on the opposite shore from Byzantium, except that really it was Byzantium that sat on the opposite shore from Chalcedon because Chalcedon was there first by about 17 years. And we could point out that the reason Byzantium ended up where it was was because Chalcedon was where it was. See, the place where it sat was a pretty miserable chunk of land, with hardly anything to redeem it. An obviously much better location was within sight, and easily noticeable by anyone who cared to look, but the people who settled Chalcedon apparently didn't. So, 17 years later, when the people who would build Byzantium, who were Athenians and Megarians, went to the Oracle of Apollo and asked where to build this great new city they had in mind, and were told to build it opposite to the blind, they all knew immediately what that meant. It meant build across from Chalcedon, because those folks were obviously blind. But they did all right for themselves anyway. At least as long as people left Byzantium alone, because every time someone got done raiding or attacking Byzantium, well, there was Chalcedon right across the way. Let's stop off there on the way back, Betty, for an after-raid raid, why not? But mostly things went okay, until some Persian guy named Otanes captured it, though we expect you already know about him. Oh, and then some other guy named Darius the Great came and built a bridge from there to Thrace so he could get a good shot at invading the Scythians. We're pretty sure you can hear about him somewhere else, too. 
But we digress. The point we were making was that while Chalcedony seems like a good word to pull out of thin air and toss at us, there just isn't much to it. You end up mostly talking about the semi-precious stones that make up what is really a group of stones under that name. After you've learned a tiny bit about agate, what else is there to do? Carnelian is a red to red brown stone, chrysoprase is a green stone because of nickel oxide, and it has crystals so fine they can't be distinguished from each other under normal magnifications, fire agate has particles of iron in it that give it its color and name, heliotrope contains iron oxide in a blood drop pattern, so it's also called bloodstone, and again, according to Pliny, it gives the wearer the power of invisibility. Moss agate is just a pseudo agate with green inclusions. Chrome chalcedony contains, surprise, chromium compounds. And onyx is a usually black and white banded stone, which is really just a black and white agate, but does have our favorite semi-precious subtype of all the stones, sardonyx. A variety with red and white bands that was rumored to have magical properties for anything from courage in battle to the gift of eloquence to a treatment for epilepsy. Somehow the name just appeals to us. So you see, Wyatt, that's why some words just don't work. They don't provide enough interesting information in enough quantity to make an episode from it. If we can't get at least 20 minutes out of it, it probably won't ever get used, regardless of whether it comes straight from the DMG or not. And if it doesn't meet that basic requirement, we'd probably have to tack on too much irrelevant information to get it in the ballpark. Oh, by the way, we might as well take this opportunity to tell you that a sittern is just a musical instrument from the Renaissance period and therefore falls outside of the presumed pseudo-medieval setting of D&D. It's a lot like a modern-day mandolin or bazooki and can trace its origins to the English guitar, but really, unless you are musically inclined, not much more is officially known about its development. Aside from the bizarre note that in the 16th to 18th centuries, it was a popular barbershop instrument that would be left available for customers to play while they waited their turn in the chair. They're still in use today, though not for barbering purposes as far as we know, mostly in Germany. So, thanks for writing in, Doc. We were happy to hear from you and to have an opportunity to explain ourselves just a little bit. We hope you understand our point of view and that not every word from the DMG is a golden opportunity. It just has to have a certain... something to make it all hang together. And besides, in the great big wide world of things which DMs and GMs should know to add flavor to their flavor text, there's plenty just laying around waiting to be picked up as is. So keep listening. There's a bit of D&D in everything. Now what's this note about us not digressing enough anymore? Thanks for listening to this listener-suggested episode. In spite of our bluff and bluster, we do love hearing from you and always keep your suggestions handy for emergency purposes. If you would like to get in touch with us, the easiest way is to head over to our website at gmwordoftheweek.com and hit the contact page there. We'd enjoy hearing anything you care to say. While you're there, don't forget to hit the support page to find ways you can help support the show, just as several people have done before you. There's a number of good options there depending on your tastes, so you shouldn't have any trouble finding something that fits your needs. Take a moment and decide what works best. We're grateful to have any support you might offer. It's our supporters and patrons that make the show what it is today. This episode was researched, written, and produced by Brian, getting the train on the track again, Casey. Music was provided by Blue Dot Sessions. One may define flattery as a base companionship which is most advantageous to the flatterer.